All right, here we go. Salute to Knicks Nation, man. Special edition of Knicks Fan TV. We are talking playoffs, Knicks and Sixers, and I had to have my guy on, man. He is none other than a two-time All-Star, two-time All-NBA, the point guard of New York City. Three-time champion in the CBA and a three-time CBA MVP. He is Starberry. Stephon Marbury finally joins Knicks Fan TV. Steph, it's an honor to have you on the show, man. How you doing tonight, man? Thanks for having me. I'm blessed, man. Thanks. Absolutely, man. Man, let, let's jump into these Knicks. Right now, 2-0 up on the Sixers in this series. What's been your impression so far up in, in these first two games, man? Um... It's been gritty, you know, it's been gritty. Um, it has been uh, a fight that um, is built for a team that's coached by Coach Tibbs. You know, you, you in order to fight like this, you got to go through that type of process to be able to grit all the way until the end, the way how they grinded it out last game, all the way down to the seconds, you know what I'm saying? And... I think this is the type of series that people will remember for a long time. That last game will already go down in history as one of the best Knicks playoff games ever. So what we're seeing is we're seeing the display of good fortune of good basketball inside of Madison Square Garden, which is pretty dope. Yeah, it's one of those guarded moments, man, where people be like, yo, I remember where I was at when, when that DiVincenzo shot went mm. down. Now, since then, mm. there's been a lot of talk about the, the referee and a lot of controversy there. They claim that, you know, the last two-minute report, Knicks, <laughs> Knicks fouled uh, Tyrese Maxey. <laughs> what, what, what do you make of all, all of the, um, the the reports coming out about the referee and the complaints by the Sixers on, in that regard? So, the, you know, from the referee standpoint, like I said, next play, you know, you can't do nothing about it. It's just chatter right now. It's just conversation based upon frustration, you know, vice versa. If it was us, we'd be wanting the same thing. It's the playoffs. You want everything. Every possession counts. You know, one of the things that Philly's complaining about is that the Knicks are doing all these analytics on these referees, the tendencies, how they call things. Back when you were playing, was that something that was either tracked or something that you guys talked about from game to game? Like, yo, we got Tony Brothers tonight. Okay, here's what to expect. Was that was that a topic of conversation when y'all got ready for games? No, we didn't have those conversations. But I think personally, guys probably had those conversations with themselves as far as them playing um, when those guys are reffing the game. So, you know, you know when you get a guy who – normally doesn't officiate you the right way kind of like you look at a chris paul scott foster type situation you you know that situation already so it's not um something that it is uncommon you know for another referee you know suspiciously because that scott foster chris paul situation is kind of serious yeah, for, for sure. And, and then, you know, also another storyline in, in this series is Jalen Brunson. Two games, hasn't shot the ball efficiently. You know, Philly, mm. I feel like Philly's doing a good job on him. They're putting a lot of wings on him. They're putting a lot of size on him. He can't really use his physicality to his advantage. I think Kelly Oubre's been doing a good job defensively. Tobias Harris has gotten that assignment. Then Nicholas Batum. And then what I'm seeing is that a couple things seems like they're staying down on all of his moves to the paint. They're not going for the fakes. Sometimes mm. when he's turning his back to make his move, his turnaround jump shots, they got a second defender helping to contest that shot. And then also, when he gets mm. past that point of attack, you got Joel Embiid right there in the middle. So as mm. a point guard, what do you think the adjustment is that, that he needs to make to be a bit more impactful in, in the early parts of the game to, to get some advantages there? That's a great point. I had pointed that out when I was doing my little live, um, up-to-date, 24-hour <laughs> Well, not twenty four hours. You getting in the game, you know, man. You getting in the media game, man. I was doing the stories. I was, I was all the way in. I was all the way into the game. Been in the game for a while, but yep. you know, so, you know, I, what I, what I've seen from what he's doing, um, there's two things. There's the, the good, and then there's the not so good. I wouldn't say bad because he's still attacking. Um, 
he's not on his angle pick and rolls. He needs to have more space where he could go left, when he could go right. He's kind of like inside of the slot area, opposed to being on an angle where he's going downhill. Um, him going to the basket and turning his back, that right now is becoming a little problem. But when the pick and roll is occurring, what he needs to do is that pick and roll, when it comes, he needs to come off the pick and roll hard and then make a move attacking downhill. He got to make a decision opposed to coming off the, the pick and roll and probing. Pro, right, right. You know, they've been studying they've been studying him and they've been watching film, which they are doing a great job as far as following out their game plan and how they have him in their space, in their temperament of how they want him to play on pick and roll. So he's playing at their pace. Mm. He has to get back into playing his attack mode downhill, going right at Joel and B. Yeah, he may get some blocks, but he got to go to his chest. He has to go and try to draw fouls. He has to use his floater. He has to use his pull-up shot. And he has to be a little bit more decisive off of the dribble coming off the pick and roll. Mm. But overall, you know, you know, the Sixers are doing a really good job defensively, but he's still maintaining his aggressiveness. That shot that he made when the shot it hit the rim and then mm-hmm. it went up and then it dropped in, that is, you know, a shooter's role, you know, especially at the end of the game. That's a that was a big, huge, huge shot. Also for his confidence. I saw he took a Another shot after the game was yeah, over yeah. to make his last shot before he left the garden, you know. But that's good psychologically, mentally. He's in the space and he knows, but everybody mm-hmm. else knows as well. So how he adjusts and how he comes out in the next game in Philly, I said by the, I said by game four, I think he'll be rolling because he should be able to make the adjustments. I'm sure him and his dad. Um, they're looking at the film, they're watching it. I'm sure his dad is breaking it down, showing how they're playing him, where he can get his pull-up jump shots at. But again, you pointed out something I was speaking about. Um, when you turn in your back, when you slow down, you give Maxi an opportunity to block your shot from the, from behind at least two or three times he had his yeah. shot blocked. Um, but at the same time, you know, he's getting he's getting to where that pull-up shot is available, but now he has to come out of his shot a lot quicker. Mm. So when he comes off the when he comes off the pick and roll, boom, he got to raise right up. Mm. So if he does raise right up, if Maxie comes from behind, he won't be able to challenge. True, true indeed, man, and well said. Who who else on this Knicks team is, has has uh, impressed you so far in these two games? Uh, Hart and Dante. You know. Also, Robinson, he has some hard stain. These those floaters he made at the end, yeah. Then that block and that rebound, those were those were game plays. You know, those are those 50 50 balls. You know, Tobias Harris, he didn't box out, you know, and and, and because of that, we got a, a, a kick out. OG made a great solid pass mm-hmm. to um, Dante at the top. For that ice cold three point Robert Horry style <laughs> shot, um, you know, so they're playing well as a team. You know, I love the bench in the game. They're staying in the game. You can see their camaraderie as a team. They just got really positive energy, you know, as far as this Knicks team, you know, and I think Tim does, you know, and and and, and um. Leon and West, they did a great job at selecting the guys you know, in a chemistry style formula, mm-hmm. you know, we got second round players. We got guys that were picked in a yeah, no 19, 20. It's no big, it's no big time. So it's, you know, that, and, and, and that's also good. It's no ego. It's just, yeah. it's just hoopers. You know what I'm saying? Everybody, mm-hmm. they like not superstars, but growing into superstars, blue call, blue collar, Hard workers, guys that scrap like old school style Knicks players. They like Clyde. He made a comment like those guys. They kind of, you know, remind him of that team that they had back in the days. Even though they had, I mean, Clyde was a superstar, and you know, but you could I understand what he was saying and the resemblance of how they play. You know that cohesiveness, yeah. <laughs> as as Clyde would say. You know, so um, it's good. It's good to see, especially as a. As a Nick fan, you know, like I told somebody, he was like, yo, I ain't know you. I said, dude, I've been a Nick fan since black and white TVs, man. Chill out. Don't play with me. 
you know, I know everything went on, went on, but at the same time, uh, never you know, left. you're a New York kid. It, it is what it is. It's never yeah. going to stop. It, it, it never leaves you, man. No, no question <laughs> no. about it. And you, you talked about, you know, the, the great guards. On the other side of the court, Tyrese Maxey is having himself a series, man. I, I, I'm looking at Big time. the matchups, especially with the starters. You know, McBride comes in, and, and I thought McBride has been doing his best job in terms of trying to keep it in yeah. front of him. But a lot of times, you know, they may have OG on him. He's not able to navigate those screens. And when Embiid setting those screens and you mm. free Max, you up, it's daylight for him. And then he's a blur going downhill. Speed. Speed, how, how speed do you, kills. Yeah, speed kills. So how, how, do, you, how kills. do you adjust for that? You know, I, I would like to see I would like to see us make him shoot some pull-up jump shots. I would like to see us converge when he drives. I would like to see us cut uh baseline off even when he drives on that angle from like the elbow because he's real smooth and fast in that area and then he can change and jump up in the air and and maneuver in the air um i would like to see us make him shoot pull up jump shots opposed of getting all the way to the basket and then we rotate and we rotate well you know we rotate we close out you know we do all of the little things defensively you know i play for tips in Boston for a short stint. So defensively, I already understand the mind frame of where he's coming from and his philosophy and his ideology and how he wants to make sure that um, his team plays conceptually as far as making sure that they move on defense, that they help each other, that they talk. Um, all of these different things, you can see that same type of energy from the 2008 championship team the boston celtics you could see that um in this team as far as how they play defense not quite there on that level but those guys are evolving into that space and you know i forgot i didn't mention mcbride his his game won like off the bench you know i gotta mention that because yeah. his energy it sparked us he came in and completely became an impact player right away and you know, he changed the game right from that first three pointer he hit, right next to the bench. You know, off of that pass from 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 Brunson. You know, he came and knocked that down, and that seems like that got him going right away. So I I forgot about him. Yeah, McBride. Yeah. He, McBride. He's been playing with a killer instinct, man. Ever since they traded yeah, quickly, yeah. and he found that opportunity to get more playing time. He mm -hmm. he hasn't let that go. He's gotten better and better and better. And now on the big stage, it seems like nothing is phasing him, man. So his story mm -hmm. ha has definitely uh, been a bright spot for the Knicks. Uh, with Embiid, you surprised he out there? You, you should, I mean, when he went down, he threw it off the out of the glass, and he went down like that. I thought he was done. Yeah. For it. I I, I I knew he was hurt when he did that. You know, I told my meniscus and he what he did was he tweaked it. You know, it's like getting it's like getting punched in the stomach and you didn't like and you didn't know that you were about to get punched in the stomach and you lose your win. Mm. That, that that's what kind of happened inside his and it created that that tension and that like pins, sharp pins. And I was like, oh man, he don't look like he's gonna be able to play, but you know that's a it's a whole process and cycle once you get your breath once it once you recover and you walk it off you know but at this point you know he 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 has to he has to leave it on the floor mm. and i i look at i look at him at this point you know playing against him in the next game I feel like he's gonna he's gonna be trying to like run people over, yeah. <laughs> like play straight bully ball, like try to use, you know, everything that he has and try try to will his team to a victory, which, as he should, you mm -hmm. know, that's what you know great players do. He is a great player. How how do you, how do players balance? That because he's in Philly, right? I mean, outside of New York, mm -hmm. it gets no more demanding than, than Philly. You Boston, same way. You you've been in them. You've been there. Mm -hmm. How do players balance that pressure to perform to to meet the expectations that the organization and the fans have, and also protect themselves? Like I always think about when I think about guys playing through injuries, especially in the playoffs. I think about Grant Hill in that playoff series mm -hmm. with Detroit, going up against the Heat and his ankle. They knew his ankle mm. was no good, and it got worse and worse and worse, and he was never the same. Mm. How, how do players mm. balance that? You know, at this point, there is no balance. Is you all in, you know, or you out? You know, you see the guys who 
have injuries and they're sitting on the bench. You know, you got Giannis, you got Zion, you know, you got different stars that are not playing because they're hurt. And, you know, at this point, some guys can take a chance and some guys, they just don't feel 100% confident to get on the court. But, you know, psychologically and mentally, it's a, it's a challenge. But I think in an MB situation, um, being that he's been cleared and he's done all of the things to, that he needed to do to, to get on the court and play, you know, he's able to play. You know, he's not 100%. We can see that he's not yeah. 100%. But who's 100% in the playoffs? True, Everyone man. has something yeah. going on. You know, after going through a long, grueling, yeah. eighty-two game season, you know, and now this is the this is the time. But this is the time. This is the best time to play basketball. There's no better yeah. time to play basketball. So, you know, it's a it's a big challenge. You know, as you mentioned, Grant Hill, his, his, his ankle never got better during those times. But, you know, I'm sure Grant would do it all over again. Mm. You know, you, you're on the court, and in those moments, you're not thinking about you know, nothing else other than trying to help your team and playing. When they talk about the the free throws and, and you know, the referees letting them play, Adam Silver talked about they, they want to take a look at things. Is, is the game shifting towards too much offense? What, what do you think about that? Do you think they need to kind of even the level the playing field a little bit? You have a lot of talented players, a lot of skillful players right now, a lot of offense in the league. Do you think that they need to shift it back to the defense a little bit? I like the game physical and grindy. That's how I like the game because that is part of your preparation and being as strong as you can be when you get on the court. That becomes your advantage. Um, when you can play a grit and grind style game and then you have the physical capabilities to go on the basketball court and play that style. Um I like I like it like how it is now as well as it being fast. I mean I'm I'm one of those guys that I'm right in the in the present of the game. I don't really look at the past of how the game is played. I feel like the evolvement of the game is where it's supposed to be and now everybody did what they were supposed to do for everyone to be able to do what they're doing right now. The way how these guys play, you look at how these guys play now at the point guard position. If you can't score, <laughs> you basically can't get the bread. Mm. But back, you know, back in the days when we were playing, if you played our style, you know, similar to the way how I play and the way how Iverson play, you, you're considered, you know, a guy who is a shoot first point guard. But now, you know, you got guys like Steph Curry. He comes down, he got control of the basketball, he shoot the basketball, he make it two, three times, mm -hmm. the next five or six shots is going up. Damon Lillard, you know, Shea, Shea Alexandra, like mm -hmm. everyone, you know. So I, I love the fact that the game is in this space, you know, because I can look back from all of the nonsense that I took but didn't care, but now yeah. see these guys hooping and playing, I'm like, okay. Like, I don't got to say nothing. I'm like, you already know what yeah. it is. Did you remember, you know, back in the early days, stages of your career, when you used to go up against those Knicks teams? Oakley was still there. You still had stocks. What was it? What, what, did they take it easy? What, I mean, of were they course. real physical with you? What, what were those no. memories like, man? Nah, they, they whipped my little ass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nah, no. It wasn't no. And they knew, too. Like, right. oh, he from NY. I already know he want to show out. Nah, they didn't play that. I, I got it. I got it. From <laughs> picks to bowls to everything. But, you know, they raise you. You mm. know, the, the, the OGs, they raise you. And, you know, that's how you get the respect in the NBA. You go mm. up against those guys and you, you bring it. And, you know, you play against them and you – give everything that you got and then they see it they see everything you got and then that's where the respect comes in at who, who was who was the point guard that that really said you know listen this this is a different this is a different animal this ain't lincoln this ain't georgia tech this is the big boys league who's that point guard that that really had to humble you in in your first year i mean i got i got humbled by 
that be my body my my first year. It ain't, it ain't nobody that, you know, it wasn't until my second year that's when it became even. Mm. My second year was even, but my first year it was a roller coaster. I had got hurt the first five minutes of my NBA career. So I missed like the first 13 or 15 games. Yeah. So, you know, I was out. Then I had to like watch and then I had to like learn all over again mm. what I what I learned in preseason and playing and all of that and then focusing on trying to get healthy and then now I'm playing against all of the the the, the best guards, Gary Payne, Jason Kidd. You just run the line, just go through it. Raj Strickland. Yeah. It ain't no easy night. You know, just those three names alone is a is a nightmare. Um but Raj Strickland was for sure. Mm. Um, my my toughest my toughest opponent, you know, throughout my my entire career. Yeah, that that's what's up, man. Once again, we're talking to Steph mm -hmm. Armand, Barry Sue, to everybody in the chat. Once again, a special edition of Knicks Fan TV Live. We are previewing the Knicks versus Sixers series, uh, Game Three, which which will start on uh, on on Thursday night, man. So looking forward to that. Mm -hmm. Now, Steph, you you still got Knicks in seven, so they up two zero. Are you just you sticking with it just because I'm that just, was your I, early prediction? I'm, I'm, I'm just I'm just I'm not getting too high. I'm not getting too low. People's like, yo, Knicks in five. I said, oh, if we get if we get it in five, great. If we can get it in four, yeah. great. You know what I'm saying? But yeah. at the end of the day, I respect Philly. I respect Embiid. I respect you know the fact that it's hard to beat somebody for for a zip. Yeah, you know what I'm saying, and, and um. I'm just I'm, I'm more so going from that aspect. I believe we're gonna win the series, though. Yeah, uh, likewise, man. I, I'm surprised with Philly, the lack of support from their supporting cast. I mean, the third best player on that team right now has been Kyle Lowry. I mean, I look at him mm. playing out there. He's been using his savvy, his veteran experience. He's schooling his, the 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 Nova pups. He he's out there, you know, swiping down on the ball, just making the little plays to to do what he needs to do to get the team to win. Kyle is a solid, solid PG. You know, he mm. knows the game. He's smart. He's strong. He's witty. He's crafty on the court. He understands all of the little tricks. You know, I seen him swipe down on Jalen a couple of times. Yeah. You know, some plays I thought, you know, Jalen would have pulled the ball in, but, you know, just that last second, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. That last second swipe. Last second. You know, don't think that it's gonna happen. It he's, he's pretty comfortable. Court. He makes shots, makes plays. He hit, he's hitting some big threes. You know, pay attention to the next game. Um, also, Tobias, we gotta watch him. We gotta watch him. He's yeah. been and he's been silent. And I'm sure he's catching some heat in Philly. I'm sure they're giving him some heat right now. You know, trying to gas him up, yeah. trying to push him for the for the next game. It's going to be lit in Philly. It's going to be lit. It's going to be crazy inside Philly. It's going to be very hostile, yeah. which we we know. So we just got to, as I said, we don't want to get too high. We don't get too low. We want to stay right in the middle. You know what I'm saying? And I think if we go in and we take their first three punches, you know, we win the first five minutes of the first three quarters and then win the last five minutes of the fourth quarter, I think we got a chance. We got a chance. Yeah. Uh, I agree with you there. I think game three is going to be the toughest one yet of the series. It might be mm -hmm. the toughest one in the entire series. Yeah, for and, sure. And for me, that's why it's important to see Jalen really get off to a hot start because, look, the role players have been carrying this team for the, over the first two games, but I don't think you can mm -hmm. lean on that every night. Like Josh Hart, mm -hmm. I mean, he's shooting 53% from three right now, which is great. And it's great to see him mm -hmm. stepping into his shots confidently, but you don't, mm -hmm. you don't want to lean on that, you, you know. Mm -hmm. um, what, do you, what do you think about the, the absence of Julius Randle? In terms of how much you know this team is missing, just a guy who can draw that attention, draw the double teams, and help create for for others. I mean, it's another scorer. Um, also, what it does is it doesn't put as much pressure on the perimeter because now you could play inside out. He can create a double team, um, and I think in the playoffs, it's a it's you know I said it I said it at the beginning. It's a grit and grind. Playing in the playoffs, you know, half court becomes super important to be able to execute, you know, being able to create an open shot. Right now, we do have to work really hard to score at in some possessions. 
um, especially when we get down. Um, OG, you know, we could get him going. If we could get him going, I think that that opens when, you know, Randall has the basketball in his sweet spot. You know, you got to play in between. You got to make a decision, which, you know, you could keep guys spaced around the perimeter. And then once that double team happens, swing, swing, open shot, drive, kick, you know, you, you need that. But at the same time, I think we've made a really good adjustment playing without playing without him. So, you know, there's a balance in it. You want your you want all your your, your big guns in the playoffs. Yeah. Um, so and I hear that he's pushing to try to get back, which is which is good. You know, the guy's morale um continues to stay high when knowing that he's pressing and pushing to try to get back. Once again, we're, st- we're talking to Stephon Marbury, Knicks versus Sixes preview. So to everybody in the chat, special edition of Knicks Fan TV Live. Uh, Steph, you, you came back to the Garden. You made your return to the Garden just a couple yeah. weeks ago. Standing ovation in MSG. An MSG moment for you. JC was there. I mean, it was great to see you two guys together. Well, what did that moment yeah. mean for you, man? It was beautiful, man, um, to be reconnected and to be welcomed by the organization. I just thank Dolan for, you know, saying yes, it could mm-hmm. go down because, you know, mm-hmm. nothing is a top down Was that you guys made, like, did you guys reach out to them? How, how did that happen? Um, Actually, Wes and I, we, you know, we, we spoke and we talked and he was like, look, Steph, you know, there were things said, things went back and forth. You know, we want you to be back. You know, we want you to be, you know, part of the part of the family. As Wes said, you know, you're part of the cloth. You're part of the cloth of the New York Knicks. You know, I spent most of my years with New York. So, you know, for me to be able to be welcomed the way how they did, I was I was super honored and thankful and appreciative towards everyone from um Leon and 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 Wes and Jamie Mathis and all of the people, Tiff, all of the people that make everything run and go. Um, they all welcomed me with open arms. I see Mr. Dolan. He gave me a hug. We talked for, you know, real brief. He said, Stefan, you know you're always welcome here. Mm. And I was, you know, I was like, you know, that that made me feel good because seeing him and him saying that to me, I already I already know it was official that me coming back to the garden, Signed he stamped off. it. So, stamped you know, seeing him and him saying that, you know, that made me feel really good because, you know, they know I'm a New York, a New York Knicks fan to the to the core. They already know that. Yes. You know, from just knowing um, all of us, we from NY. So um, for me to be able to get that type of love, especially from our fans, it was beautiful. Now, it, it was a great moment, man. It, it was truly a great moment. And for me, as a fan, back at that time and now covering the team, I felt like it was a moment where it's like, you know, you, you, you have a fallout with a family member, you have a fallout with a sibling, and, you yeah. know, time just heals all wounds. That's that's kind of how I felt, man, because I remember when the trade first went down, it was one of those moments where I'm like, I knew exactly where I was at as a kid. Going through the roof, yo, Steph is coming home, Penny coming, like, it, it was crazy. So, you know, obviously everything that happened and the, the lack of success and whatnot, yeah. it just felt yeah. like, yeah. you know, it just came yeah. back together, man. It was nice to see that. Oh, no doubt. And that shows growth. You know, as my sister said, she said both of you were willing to go forward at the same time, which is what makes it even more special. Because sometimes, you know, you're not ready or they're not ready. You know what I'm saying? But we both were ready at the same time. And I thought that um, being able to be in that space, it shows growth, you know, as an organization, um, which you can look at the culture of the organization right now is super positive, which is why the energy is flowing the way how it's flowing. The people in the garden, the energy, the vibration is you know, it's super magnetic in a, in a in a positive way, and it's spreading. It's spreading throughout the whole city, and that basketball culture is being enriched by this energy that everyone is manifesting amongst each other. So I think that for me to be able to be a part of that, 
and to be able to share my energy and my love for my team and my basketball knowledge and understanding about the game um, and being able to go in depth with the team in the future is, is super positive. No, I, absolutely, man. And how do you, mm -hmm. like, looking back on it now, how, how did you reflect on, on your time when, when, uh, when you were playing for the organization? You know, it was a, I had a, it was a great experience, you know, when I look back and I reflect, um, I'm 47 years old right now. And I played when I was in my thirties, um, after coming to China, being here over the last 14 years. And then when I look back, I'm like, wow, you know, I had a chance to play in the Mecca, despite everything that went on, it was a great experience because I was able to experience all that I was supposed to experience before I came here and when I when I came to China. So all of that of what I what I learned, I was able to take that, take that and bring that here and bring it and make it into something positive. You know, utilizing that energy, you know, from not winning, not being successful, learning and you know seeing what, what I could do better, seeing what I could do different and bringing it, you know, to another lead. It, it helped. And people think China, playing in China is easy. It's not. Mm. It's super hard. <laughs> it's FIBA rules. It's mm. boxing one, boxing two, triangle. It's all that. You know what I'm saying? Zone, smaller court, shorter three-point line. Defense is way different. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not an open game like the NBA. It's not the same. It's completely different, which is why we're looking at how basketball is evolving globally right now. We mm -hmm. got to practice for the Olympics. We can't just get on the court no more. Yeah. So that's the FIBA game. So for me to be able to have went through all of those experiences in New York, um, good, bad, and indifferent. You know, it was, it was all, it's all good right now. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's all part of the journey. It's all part of the lessons for the blessings. No, no, you, you hit it on the head, man. Well said. And, you know, of those teams during your era, I thought the team that had, first of all, I love when JC came through. He's a friend of the program. Shout out to Jamal Crawford, 100%. When it was JC, Zebo, you had D Lee. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Eddie. Eddie mm. was playing at that time in that mm. season. He was borderline an all star in that stretch. Mm. I remember I was mm. at that game when when um when y'all played Carmelo and the Nuggets and, and y'all ran him out the gym. Nate was coming <laughs> off the bench. <laughs> hey, I I thought that team had potential, man. I, I really did. We, we just weren't. We didn't. We didn't. It didn't. It didn't stick. We couldn't stick, and we couldn't stick and grow. Um, but. It was good times. You know, we yeah. had some great games in there. The game we played against Philly when Nate hit the three. Yeah. Uh, Jamal's 50 something points against Just Miami. Yep, yep. Channing Fries. Pistons. Last second shot. You know, it was some really great games that we had. And our young guys, they grew and they got thick. You know, they, the, the, the way how they started to play, you know, later on in their careers. Mm. You can see that the base of them coming from when they were young little baby boys coming mm -hmm. into the NBA from college, you know, you, you you saw you can see the growth later on in their careers, which is pretty dope. It's pretty yeah. cool. Did did you feel like playing at home was it was it viewed did you view it as a positive or a negative when when you look back at it? Like Um Playing on a court wasn't a negative, you know, mm. the, all of the other stuff off the court, family and doing, yeah. you know, living the life in, 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 in NY, that was a little, that was a little challenging, but it wasn't really that bad. It wasn't like how people would perceive it to be. Um, I just mm. think, you know, during those days and during my times, um, I could have done a lot of things different. Um, I did some things good, but I think I could have done some things completely different than how. Um, I handle things. Um, I think I was more so in a defense mechanism system of how I was, you know, then towards certain situations as opposed of just allowing things to just play out. Mm -hmm. But as I said, you know, all of that was part of my growth and development. So mm -hmm. that's why I say I look at um, being in New York as 
it's positive because you know it helped me it helped mature me it helped grow me um it allowed me to be able to see where i can um be stronger at and, and one of the things uh, I'm always fascinated about, especially with, with superstar careers, is because at a young age, I mean, you, you're the king of the city, right? You got trophies all in the crib, and, and he got game based on your life. The Lincoln High School and, and, and point guard, and you come into the league number four in the draft, AI, the, the historic 96 draft. And then you, you have a career arc. Everybody does, right? All the time catches mm -hmm. up. The league passes on by. You know, you have, you have the the quote during the D'Antoni time where you said, I'm a starter. That That's how you look at it. Mm -hmm. But, you mm -hmm. know, where most people have that career arc and then go on to bigger and better things, you had that arc and then established yourself in a whole nother league, a whole nother continent, a whole nother country, mm -hmm. and became a megastar. How do, I mean, how do you reflect on that? Because I've never really seen that in, in sports. Um, You know what? That was all ordained by God. That's how I feel about it. Because when I look at um, when I left to go to China, if someone told me all of the things that were going, all of the things that happened in China thus to this point, I would have told them that they was crazy, that they was lying, that something was wrong with them, and that, you know, there's no way that I'll receive all of the accolades, you know, from going from where I was at in New York and then, you know, the short stint in Boston, which wasn't really good because I, I didn't play for almost four or five months, and then I finally played. But, you know, coming to China and doing all of what was done is like uh, a completely different script from what I thought in my life. I would never have thought that I would have left the NBA, be gone for the last 14 years of my, my life, living in China, yeah. love China, make, make China my home. I'm from New York, Brooklyn, Coney right. Allen. Come on, that was like, that's not even something that, you know, could even be, you know, thought of I wouldn't even fathom the idea of thinking that I would be living abroad you know growing up playing basketball you know AAU Gauchos yeah. Lincoln Georgia Tech you know NBA that would it would never have been a thought so you know I'm 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 super blessed for the opportunity that God allowed me to be able to have and being the only person to ever do something that was done in basketball going to the most populated country on the planet um playing basketball where there are most basketball players on earth um registered over 400 million people in china that play basketball to be able to come here and do the things that have been done you know it's it's just a blessing that's all i could describe it as i could use a variety of different words but the blessing is just what it is it was more so you know what god wanted as you as you talked about, a kid from Coney Island hits Beijing, first day one. What what is that adjustment like? What what is that adjustment like for you? You know, when I first came, it was like, okay. So when I came, the time period that I came, I was like, what? This was I didn't play for a long period of time. I was depressed. I had was dealing with so many different things. My dad passing away, just a lot. Mm -hmm. So. When I got here and I landed, it was like 5,000 people at, at, at the airport, wow. you know, and I'm like, who are these people here? They were like, they're here for you. Wow. And I'm like, so that right there, it just put me in a space of comfort that, okay, this could be, this could be okay. This could be all right. You know, they showing mad love from the beginning. Um, the cultural barrier, the food, the language, all of those things, it was a factor, but it wasn't something that, it wasn't a deal breaker, mm. you know what I'm saying, mm -hmm. which is obviously I'm still here, so it, it wasn't a deal breaker at that time, so I felt like I was on a different path in my journey towards what it was that I was seeking was right before me, so I just stayed on the journey, I stayed on the path have and I continue to just do what it was that I was doing 
And, and now they, they built statues for you. And, and you said on, mm. on your interview with, with JC that after the second one, that was really a, a pivotal moment in your life. Could you ex expound mm. on that a little bit? Well, why was it? It was a pivotal moment because at that time, I was a little... Um, I was a little shocked that they wanted to build another statue and I kind of felt a little overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. You know, the first statue I felt kind of like, wow, is this real? Like, why? Like, I, I had so many questions. Even when it happened, I kind of felt like, man, this is such a, a, a big, a, this is such a big thing. Um, and I'm still playing. That was the wild part. Like I still was hooping. I still like we won two two more championships. Mm. You know, three championships in four years. So, you know, when we won the second championship, I was like, no. And it was like, what do you mean, no? You don't want us to build another statue. And I was like, this is too much. And they just was like, oh no, we we have to. This is this is something that we 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 must do. Wow. And I was like, well, if you guys feel like you must do this, I was like, the only way that I'll accept this if you put my teammates on it. Because mm -hmm. during that time, you know, I had missed a lot of the season because I had tore my meniscus. So I think, you know, from the way how I came back, I went and got surgery, stayed in America for a year, uh, for about a month. Mm -hmm. Came back 63, day, 63 days later, then led the team to the championship. So it was kind of like, like how? At my age, I was mm. taking cortisone shots, pulling, you know, like 120 cc's of blood out of mm. my knee because my knee kept swelling up from playing in the playoffs with a, you know, a surgically repaired knee. Mm. You know, and they, you know, when it was explained to me, I understood where they were coming from and why, you know, and... I was just like, I, I can't accept this. I was like, it's just, I feel like, you know, my teammates, they were the ones who made sure they held everything down for me to get to this point to be able to come. And, you know, yeah, I played the last 18, 19 games to win the championship, to help win the championship. But um, I just felt like it was a it was a lot. So here in China, is a lot that, you know, when a guy's from another city, another province they got to get permission for certain guys to be on to be a, to be on a statue in beijing you know beijing is you know it's the capital you know mm -hmm. people who live here they have you know it's like if like for instance people from other cities if they wanted to buy a house on a car here it's very difficult yeah. because they're not born in beijing so they can't you know, I was able to do all of these things because of playing basketball, winning championships here. So all of these different things that came about, you know, was a big part of winning. And, you know, when, when they when they said that they was going to put my, my teammates on the statue, they all were like, like, you really did this for us? I was like, I didn't do anything. I just told them that you guys deserve as well, it was like, man, our kids, our family will be able to see this forever. Like, this is super monumental for us in our lives as basketball players, as people, you know. And I was like, you know, this is what it's really about. You know, we did this together. So, you know, being able to be in that light and be in that space, um, it was super humbling because I could see the pure joy from um how they felt when I received my statue, but then to, for them to see themselves on a statue, it's pretty cool. Yeah, and I, I think it's very interesting, again, along, along that arc, because as you first starting off, it's, it's all about you, right? And now, mm. and later on in your career, it's you kind of giving back to the game. And, you know, you mm. look at all these interviews, so many people from Sham God, Jamal Crawford, Allen Iverson mm. saying, uh, you know, you, mm. you were one of two people who intimidated him. So, I mean, that has to feel good for you to kind of get your flowers, but also for people to acknowledge the contribution, the strawberries, you know, the, the contributions that, that you made to the game. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that that's what that's that's what it's all about. You know what I'm saying? Someone did that for us. You know, some there are guys that paved the way for us. Kenny Anderson, Rod, you know, even, you know, all of the OGs that, that played the game. Terry Porter, that was my... 
you know, Michael Williams, mm. those are my my vets, Doug Williams, I'm mean, Doug West, mm. um, Sam Mitchell, Sam. all of these guys, they played a vital role in careers, especially when you're a rookie. You know, you those guys were great, you know, and making sure that they kept it 100 with us, mm. you know. So doing the same thing for the next generation and for players um, behind is, is, is important. And as I said, you know, I grew a lot. I learned a lot. Um, being able to have this experience and being in another country, you know, where basketball is super huge. A lot of people don't even know how big basketball is mm. in China. They have no clue. But now people do, mm. you know, people are aware. People, More people are learning. Like, here we are, we're speaking and talking you know, on an NBA platform about the CBA, which is is great because the game is evolving, is is growing, is getting better and better globally. More and more players are playing, so that's 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 what it's about. That's what I want to see. I want to see that. I love this game, and I want to see this game continue to grow. Well, once again, we're talking to Stephon Marbury. So to everybody in the chat, uh, Nick CP, the franchise here, special edition of Nick's Fan TV. Uh, a couple more quick ones here for you, Steph. When AI says, you know, he, he was one of the, the few people that intimidated me. And you guys go back, way, way back to the beginnings, to the essence. Talk about that competitive fire, that iron sharp and iron, you know, that love between you and AI. Exactly what it is. Exactly what it is. I mean, Allen is down as one of my top five players that is the hardest to guard. Pound for pound, he's the best basketball player I've ever seen. I've never seen a guy that small do the things that he did on a basketball court. Playing against him, you already knew what it was going to be. You were going to be chasing him the whole night. <laughs> 30 points, you already knew. That was a that, That's basically the marker for him, 30 mm. points. So you know he's going to get 30. You know what I'm saying? And the way how I played against Allen was I played physical with him and I always tried to get him to guard me. Like, because I always, because I'm a bigger guard. Mm. So, I, you know, uh, Snow used to guard me. Aaron McKee yeah. used to guard me. It was it used to always be bigger, bigger guards that were would guard me and I would mm. try to, get him to guard me to make him play defense to wear him down. But, you know, that didn't really happen that much. But I always, you know, I was the one that was checking him because I was fast enough to guard him. Yeah. But it was always, it was always hard. It was always a nightmare playing against him because you already know. Not only can he score, but he does it in a way where it's, it's just prolific. You know, it's in bunches. He can score super fast. Before you know it, you have 10, 11 points right. in a, a minute, two minutes, and you don't even realize. And you look up, you're like, how do you got 40 already? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's the third yeah. quarter with like five minutes to go, and he already got 40. So, you know, whenever you hear guys like that speak and talk about you in that manner, it's just it's the utmost respect, as always. And that's why I'll never forget that 0-1 All-Star game in D.C., man, when, when you guys brought the East back, you know what I mean, just to see you on the stage, Classic. see AI on the stage, you had Houston and Sprewell representing the Knicks, and then the East coming back, because, you know, the West would always get the, the upper hand on the East a lot of the times, especially in the post-Jordan years, so it was dope to see that, but now that the game is a shell of itself, man, it's, it has to disappoint you a little bit, you know, like... What's going on, man? We we build up the hype on Saturday even, night you know, and you know what? get to the game is nothing, man. I feel like I think they need to have uh all I they need to have an A and a B. I think they need to have like all of the guys that make the all-star game, the top players. I think they need to ask those guys, like, are you going to play? Right. If you're going to play, raise your hand. If not, don't right. play. Just sit it out. You know, accept your award that you're all star. Just chill on the bench. Let yeah. the guys who really want to hoop and get it on, get it on. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, I want that. I want that UCLA mentality when they get on, get on the court. I understand and I get it, but shooting, shooting courts, shooting shots, as soon as the basketball is inbound, I'm it's off that. I'm not. I'm not rolling. I'm yeah. not. I'm not rolling. I'm not rolling. I'm who, you know, what I'm saying like making an all star game. That was like, it's not. Um, 
how should I say, it, it, it was a reward to make the All-Star game. Like, right. you put in the work in the summertime, you know, you go hard in the beginning of the season, you know, you're in shape, you ready, you're focused, you're locked in, you're trying to help your team establish themselves early, you know what I'm saying? And then your opportunity from the individual side for you playing well, you get rewarded. Now it's like, is that a reward? Or is it like I'm supposed to? I think you know, guys have to um, play. They gotta. Yeah. They just who? Just just who? Like you don't even gotta. You don't gotta. Nobody's saying you gotta play a hundred percent, but you can who? You still can play. It's just like you know. Nobody practices a hundred percent in practice. Right. Like like playing in a game. Nobody's doing that. I mean, they could talk all of that. Oh, yeah, you got to practice as hard as you practice so the game is easy. Yeah, I got that. But that's not actually what's happening in the 82 game season. It's not going down like, like that. It's, it's tough Period. to see, man. So, yeah, for me, just I feel like they should just play. Just just get on the court and just hoop. Just yeah. play. Yeah, I, I'm with you, man. The dudes that want to load manage, y'all come through, enjoy the weekend, do whatever you do, do your marketing and all of that. Get to check, have a seat. But everybody who wants to play, then, then you, then you have that, and you know what? Expand yeah. the rosters a little bit. Expand the rosters. Yeah, the a little fans bit. pay the money to come. You know, they they want to see like, and it's like every year now, and it's kind of like you kind of waiting idle to see what's gonna happen. And right. You know, it's it's like now it's like you kind of know what's going to happen. Yeah. So yeah. it's kind of like, all right, we got to switch something up. Something got to give. Something got to change. It's just it ain't it ain't it. Yeah. It ain't it. it, it That's ain't not it. it. Not at all, man. Last one for you. Your all-time Nick Five with you at the one, you at the point guard. Give me your other f- other four that you want to play with. Your other four. My God. Please, why you do this to me? <laughs> oh, my God. You say you're a Knicks fan. This, this, this is Knicks fan TV, Steph. You know, we, we, we got to hear what you got to th- uh, say, man. Your all-time five, you at the point. I'm just going to – I'm going to pick a team. Can I pick a pick team? A team. I'm going to say pick Bernard. Okay. Okay. Okay, I'm going to go Big Pat. Okay. I'm going to go Bernard. I'm going to go Mello. Mm. You go mellow at the three, mellow at the four. I'm gonna go mellow at the three. Mellow at the three. Okay. Um at the two. I'm gonna take the two and I'm gonna let Clyde take the one. <laughs> hey, there, there you go. <laughs> there you go. So, <laughs> That's so how Clyde, I'm gonna do that. Steph, Bernard, Bello, and, and Big Pat. That that's the squad. Yeah. That that's the squad right I'm there. I'm gonna go man. with that. A formidable yeah. squad, man. Well, well, Steph, listen, man, I definitely appreciate all the time. I know you got a busy schedule going on. It's great to chop it up on, on Knicks playoffs and, and reminisce about uh, about your career, man, and, and the good days, man. But uh, listen, oh, man, no. hopefully, hopefully, you know, you can come back and join us, man, recap the series and recap the playoffs with us. Oh, I'm coming home in, in, in like six days. Oh, let's go. I'll be, I'll be there. Let's go. I will be there. Let's. I'll be in the building. Trust. Even for the closeout or for the second round, I'm there. There it is, man. We'll, so we'll save journeys, man. And, and uh, hopefully we'll talk soon, man. Appreciate the time once again, Lessons. bro. Love. Love. All right. All right. Peace. No doubt.